Dames en heren, ladies and gentlemen, um, before I start, I have to uh, say that I think we can um, conclude also with the water diamond paradox. Now, somebody who was actually a student uh, shouted the answer when Peter asked about the water diamond paradox, and he mentioned the thing called marginal utility. And it works like this, eh? each bottle of water you consume, it tends, tends to be worth less. So I have this challenge, I'm the last water, water bottle of the seminar. And water doesn't suffice at the end of something as uh, um, engaging and um, as, uh, as heavy as two days of economics. So we'll, we'll dish the water and we'll have some nice cool white wine and red wine to uh, celebrate this after we're finished. So there's, uh, there is something better than a last bottle of water uh, after this. So, but my job is to tell you a little bit about BE and capital allocation. And I'm going to want to do two things. I want to, uh, I'm going to sort of not say too much about the politics of it, because that's not what this topic's about. This is about understanding the economic implications of BE. One, why? One, because we want to be able to say with confidence why we think it's uh, the economic consequences of it is. And if we can discuss something like this at the level of economic consequences, and I think if that was all that mattered, I think we wouldn't be sitting with something like BE. But so we must get that argument clear to ourselves, not only as, as uh, people who engage in public discussion, but also in our companies and in wherever we have to make decisions. We have to have the intellectual uh, understanding of, of the economic effect of BE so that we can decide, do we want to do this? What are, what are the consequences to us as a business, as a society, uh, and, and the economy at large? And second, uh, my purpose is, at, at the end, I will give some ideas of potential strategies. It's just a, a few brief remarks about strategies I've seen adopted um, to deal with, uh, with BEE. So BE and capital allocation. Uh, so first I'll say something about the history of BEE. I'll tell you what I think BEE is about. Uh, then we'll say why ownership is important, because, uh, spoiler, I'm going to say BEE is about ownership um, and not about anything else. Uh, why is ownership important? When you redistribute ownership, what happens to society and to a company? And uh, then uh, strategies for dealing with BEE. So, BEE, as we know today, it's a shorthand for something called black economic empowerment, or if you want to use the triple B double E, it's broad-based black economic empowerment. Now, in, uh, it has a pre-statutory phase and a statutory phase. Now, in the early 90s, for example, companies like Sunlum and Momentum and others started doing transactions out of their own, um, which, which you can call BE transactions. It was basically transactions where they distributed ownership and tried to get new shareholders on board. Now, there's a business rationale for that, because you, depending on what your business strategy is. I'm not going to say too much about the pre-statutory phase, because we're interested in what, this, what, uh, what effect it has when it, has bec when it became law. Now, that phase, the pre-statutory phase, passed in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, President Thabo Mbeki appointed a commission, the Black Economic Empowerment Commission, and he, uh, he gave that to somebody to lead, uh, the chairman, and that was a gentleman by the name of President, no, so he wasn't a president then, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa. So the BE we have today that dates back the statutory phase we've, we've had now for about 20 years almost. Uh, actually, 2003 it was, became a law. But um, the, the statutory phase uh, is inspired by a document written by President, now President Cyril Ramaphosa from the BE Commission. And that document recommended legislation to redistribute ownership. Um, it said a couple of things. One of the things it said, it said, left alone, markets tend to reinforce existing distributions of incomes and assets. This is especially so in the context of globalization and unacceptable, where the market mechanism deliberately distorted markets to allocate incomes and assets on non-price criteria such as race. I want to, I put up this quote here because it gives us an idea of their thinking behind BEE. What we have here is a uh, it says that markets tends to reinforce existing distributions. Um, and it also says that um, there was a distortion. Uh, the market mechanism deliberately distorted markets. It's actually a little bit confused. It's not clear from this paragraph whether the previous government policy actually caused the distortions or whether the market caused the distortions. And this sort of um, 
misconception is, is throughout that BE Commission. What we see is both hostility towards markets and hostility uh, towards legislation. And the answer to that, of course, is new legislation. And that came in 2003. The law was written and in 2004 became an act. So in January this year, it was 15 years of statutory BE in South Africa. All right. But of course, it slowly, slowly started to having an had a, have an effect. Uh, when I say the act was in 2004, it became into effect. And then there was a new revised act in 2013. And in between, there were some changes in the codes. And I think last year, there was, or the year before, there was another revision of the Black Economic Empowerment Act. Um, all right, so you have an act. And the, if you read the act's goal, it will say it's growth and equality through racial redistribution of ownership. You have the codes to support them. Those codes say whether you get points or not. And it says for what you get points. And um, uh, that's what, what BE is about. Now, very few people have actually done studies about the economic effect of BE. There have been some studies about how to best structure BE deals or how to, uh, or the impact on a single company or so. But no studies have actually looked, very few, have looked at the economy-wide, the merits, the economic impact of BE. The first one was Professor Philip Black in 2002, then uh, Darren Asimoglu. Um, some of you may remember President Titu, uh, President, uh, Minister of Finance Titu Mbuweni recently convened a panel of economists. Ricardo Hausmann was, was there and uh, some other, Danny Roderick and so on. So Darren Asimoglu was actually part of a group appointed initially by Thabo Mbeki 15 years ago. Uh, and in 2007, they all came up with a report. And so they've done a study, Black's done a study, and then... I've done a short study. Uh, but no one else has really looked systematically that I found the effect of BE from an economic point of view. Of course, from a legal point of view and so on. It has been done, for example, by David's colleague here, um, Anthea Jeffrey at the IRR. Um, that was a legal study. And then BE is, of course, about the practice. So there's the act that says it's about growth and equality through racial redistribution. There are the codes. And those codes says, well, there's, there are targets for ownership, management control, skills development, uh, business or supply chain development, and socioeconomic development. But when you look at the codes and when you look at the practice today, what it really boils down to is what Minister Rob Davies here said in 2012, just before the release of the latest codes. It says, black economic empowerment is not just a social and political imperative. We need to make sure that in the country's economy, control, ownership, and leadership are reflective of the demographics of society in the same way the political space does. That's why we are saying BE remains an economic imperative. Now, whether I have nothing to say about the ethics of this or the politics of this, I have simply just to point out that the, the, the purpose of BE is to replace the normal economic process with a political allocation process. And if you look at these uh, uh, kinds of quotes, if you, uh, and if you look at the scorecards, where ownership has become a sort of a primary uh, pr pr uh, 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 sub-minimum category, as they call it, it is really clear that it, uh, you, you can talk about these other factors, but the main, main issue of BE lies at the level of ownership. So that's why I'm going to speak, when I speak to you about BE today, I'm going to just investigate what does BE have to do with ownership and with the economy after that. Um, that by in, incidentally, that uh, economist Hausman in 2008, appointed by Minister Mbeki and who Minister uh, Mbueni recently uh, re uh, reinvited, called BE an open ended tax on existing and new capital. They also identified, uh, and as, as did Asimoglu, um, that BE is all about ownership. All right, now, why is ownership important? So, uh, of course, it motivates you as the owner or anybody else, but let's put that aside for a moment because it's individual. Socially, it matters because economic growth um, and, uh, and consumer satisfaction is, uh, is, uh, is important. So, um, if ownership is distributed wrongly to people who make less good decisions, we're going to see less growth and so on. And then the question is, so what determines economic growth? Now, uh, economic growth is determined by two elements, by the available quantities of goods, how many things we have we can use, all right? So, the resources. And then secondly, the ownership of those resources, that is, who decides how they're combined? So we can have a lot of stuff lying around, but if you don't have a, the, uh, depending on how good your ideas are for combining them, that's how the economy is going to work or not. So that's why ownership is important. So 
if, uh, if, if uh, that's why economic, uh, that's the source of economic growth. Now, um, all this stuff lying around has to be owned by somebody. Now, if you make me own a farm, that farm's not going to be very productive. If you give me an IT firm, the IT firm's not going to be very productive, no matter how good those resources are. And so, um, it's important uh, there's a sort of a certain function in the economy, and each of us fulfill that function depending on our context, and especially in a business context, th those people are called entrepreneurs. It's people who decide how resources are allocated. That's the entrepreneurial function. And if you're a bad entrepreneur, you make bad decisions about resource allocation. But it's not very simple, because entrepreneurs have to think three, four, five years into the future, sometimes decades f very far ahead, and then they have to understand and they have to make an estimation about what the future will look like um, and that's not a, a skill everybody has um, and it's also not a skill everybody has in all dimensions so um, so uh, the people who allocate these who make these allocation decisions are called entrepreneurs now you, um, uh, and the question is of course so we have resources in the economy we want economic growth um, and we have entrepreneurs who, who should um, allocate these resources and combine them. But how do we find these resources, these entrepreneurs? How do we find them? There are basically two ways that I want to contrast. The first way is you can have a people who appoints the entrepreneurs. Well, the politicians can. And that, that's what happens in the Soviet Union. In extreme cases of complete communism, it's, it's not like there are no entrepreneurship. There's still estimation of the future. You have to combine things, and like David Ruth says, you're going to get titanium roofs, and uh, what did he say? So, so the Soviet Union is going to provide you with all kinds of stuff you don't need, um, because politicians decided who will make the allocation decisions. Uh, the other alternative is that the market leads this process, that the consumers decide who actually is successful or not. So when Peter Klein discussed how prices are formed, he said the Marxists think prices uh, depend on the, on, the, on, the, on the prices of the input goods. You know, all, everything you have to combine to get the final product, that determines what the final product will cost. And Peter said, no, the correct way to think about this is actually that the final uh, price of a, of a thing depends on what people are willing to pay for it. So every day someone walks to spar and buys or don't buy uh, a, a bread, buys or do not buy a, a bread or a certain bread in favor of another one, um, that's actually an evaluation of, of the entrepreneurial function. Do we like um, fizzes or do we like apples better? It depends. Do we like these or other apples better? It, uh, that is a judgment we pronounce as consumers over um, the quality of the entrepreneurs who supplied us with that. Uh, I'll quote Mr. Klein here. Uh, entrepreneurs are decision makers who invest resources based on their judgment of future market conditions, investments that may or may not yield a positive return. And that judgment implies ownership. So when we discuss BE and capital allocation, when we have to decide and uh, debate this with somebody else, and what's, the, what's the, the consequence of this, these are the elements of our argument. We have to include the, uh, the entrepreneurial function in our argument, and we have to include the, uh, the ownership question. And uh, then we have to say that central to BE is the question of ownership. Uh, but central to economic growth is the question of the quality of the allocation of capital resources. So that's why ownership is very important. And I'm going to skip this because of the marginal utility. Of value, uh, marginal utility. And I'm going to skip this graph, but um, it uh, uh, anyway harks back to that point. But I will make the point, though. So I, I, can, I can identify three things that happen if you redistribute ownership in an economy. Now, of course, black economic empowerment has black in there, so it's about, uh, this is what the specific policy's aim is. Um, but these points I make apply uh, generally, which is also good, um, because it allows you to, uh, to think what will happen in Venezuela um, or anywhere else. So to society, to society, something else happens. So let's say some of you in this audience will be fairly wealthy, some of you will be less wealthy. If we redistribute from the wealthy people in this audience to the less wealthy people, the assets, suddenly the less wealthy people in the audience will have lots of disposable income, much more than you have usually. So you, you've, you've tried to save and save and save, so you've tried to resist spending, and suddenly you have all this disposable income, you're going to start spending more. 
And you're going to start spending much uh, at a greater, you have a greater inclination to spend. You're going to spend at a greater tempo, consume more than you did before you had these assets. So you have suddenly, surprise, surprise, like I win the lotto, you're going to start buying maybe a good bottle of champagne or something, or uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, something, something nice, a piece of milk tart, or I don't know. But um, the point is that if, if we redistribute assets um, suddenly from people who have actually saved those assets, they've not consumed, that's why they're in existence. Somebody who has those assets, they're not, they haven't consumed them. They have an inclination to save them. And we redistribute them to somebody else who's been holding back until he has more disposable income. They're going to see more spending. So one, the first effect of BE is if you have a large-scale transfer of ownership, in this case uh, based on race, uh, but it can be on any other thing, uh, on, on any other basis. We're going to see a decrease in investment, and we're going to see an increase in consumption. So we're going to see what Rob referred to as the capital structure. We're going to see that uh, p production capacity of the capital structure decline. So the first thing that happens is to society, we have more consumption, and we have less production. All right. Um, then the second thing that happens is to a company something happens. And that is depending on the extent of the ownership change and depending on the, what that means, um, there will be a decrease in the quality of entrepreneurial judgment. It doesn't have to do anything with race, but in this case it does have uh, because that's the basis for the policy. Uh, but why, will it, why do I say the entrepreneurial judgment will decrease? Well, because um, those new owners, of course, wants to have a say and will have a say in the business. And I remember what Rob Davies uh, had said. He says the purpose of this is to transfer not only ownership nominally, but effectively. We want to transfer um, decision-making rights in the economy. Now, normally decision-making rights, as I said, are allocated every time we buy something. As consumers, we can say, I like this banana or I don't. And then the farmer who provided that banana, uh, or the, 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 whoever the, the shop, will be penalized or not, depending on whether they uh, provided something good. Um, but now, if we transfer ownership in another way, if we include political allocation of ownership, now we're going to have uh, ownership allocation based not on consumer satisfaction, but based on political satisfaction. Now, political satisfaction may or may not be good, but it's not economic growth. It's not the same as the consumer. It's not, there has to be a mismatch. Um, and so, there will be a decrease in the quality of entrepreneurial judgment. There will be a decrease in the quality of foresight and of combination of resources. Not because of any inherent characteristics of the owners, but because the mechanism of reward changed. Right? So, to a company, there will be a decrease in the quality of entrepreneurial judgment. And I'm not even saying anything now, about it because many companies, of course, uh, you, you're selective in who you partner with, because uh, it depends on, there's all sorts of transaction costs in, in coordinating with people. So, I'm not even venturing into any sort of complexity increases, just in the decrease in the quality of entrepreneurial judgment. Why? Because of the mechanism change between political and consumer allocation. And then finally, what happens when you redistribute ownership uh, is something happens to the economy, and that is lower growth. And that lower growth is, has to do with when all these company effects together are, are rolled up, uh, when each company has slightly less good um, allocation of capital, slightly less consumer satisfaction, that is a decrease in economic growth. Um, remember this quote, economic growth is determined by two elements, by the available quantities of goods and by the adroitness. I had to look that word up as well. Um, uh, but it means the skilledness or the, uh, the, 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 your, your capacity for making good uh, judgment, the adroitness, the alertness with which these available factors of production are combined. And so if the adroitness decreases then to the economy, there will be lower growth. Okay. So the three effects is to society, an increase in consumption and a decrease in investment. To a company, a decrease in the quality of entrepreneurial judgment. That's at the micro level. And then at the macro level, uh, a lowering of growth. So none of what I've said now has inherently anything to do 
with race. It has to do with mechanisms. And if you substitute BEE -E, and you substitute that B for anything else and in Venezuela, you call it CE for communist economic empowerment or something, you have the same effects. Um, and I think that that can be an important um, understanding in your own ability to um, consider the ethics of whatever position you take on BEE -E, uh, and whatever, um, however fa steadfast you are in that position. You always, and that's a, I think a, a moral requirement of all of us, you want to be sure and uh, you want to be sure that you're acting fair, that you're acting also not in your own interest but in the general interest. And I think what we're seeing here is, and I'm convinced of that, that it's not in the general interest um, actually to uh, support BEE, or BEE in general is not in support of the people uh, in South Africa in general. And that's an important understanding because much of the argument about BEE is that that's exactly what it does. BEE is good for everybody. It's a matter of justice and fairness that you should do it. And it helps economic growth. Well, we can cut that and we can draw a line right through that economic growth argument because it doesn't. And it's not surprising then that we would see in the um, recommendations by Hausman and by Asimoglu, by the most senior economists in the world, vir virtually all serious economists who've, who's published on BE in general has recommended that the ownership element be taken away from it. All right. Um, so finally, I'll conclude with some strategies uh, for dealing with BE. Just some thoughts. Uh, and I'll finish with that quote. So the first is that you can, I think, so let's say uh, you're skeptical. You share my skepticism of BE. You can decrease exposure to state and state-related sectors. Because that's, of course, how the BEE Act is enforced. But it's not very easy. It's difficult. It's difficult because of the chain reaction of supplier requirements. And it's also difficult because of increasing uh, um, permit and licensing requirements in the mining sector, these charters, etc. All have, um, uh, make, make it difficult, makes it difficult for you. But, but you, do not, um, you do not have to stop at that. Um, depending on the size and scope and market share and, and uh, nature of your business, your firm, you can decrease exposure to state and state-related sectors. Um, you can do that within or outside of South Africa. You can also identify niche value propositions. Now, I know of companies, you might know of them as well, companies who are so good at what they do and uh, who have def found a niche um, in what they do that actually they have the ability to say, no, we're not, uh, this is who we are, take it or leave it. Um, and I think that's not a position all of us or the whole economy can be in, but it's a good position. Some people would call that monopoly power, but I think this is another example of how monopolies aren't completely bad if they're free market monopolies. Because you, see, you, can actually, you can actually influence at the margin, again, state policy, because you can either comply or not. You have market power. And I'm quite comfortable with market power and not complete government power. So actually an interesting balance struck here between market and government. So uh, balance of power, shall we say. Um. And then thirdly, I think you could develop international client and supplier bases. Um, it's not only a good idea because it gives, it gives you some RAND hedging, South African RAND hedging, if you have income streams in dollar or euro. But if you develop international client and supplier bases, they actually, I've just returned from a trip to Europe, uh, London, and, and I've been to at The Hague and Amsterdam, and wherever we go, uh, we've tried, you know, where we thought it was appropriate to explain some of the difficulties um, in South Africa and some of the legislative environment. And I found it very difficult to explain to an international audience, whether they're in business or in government or in think tanks, that there actually are policies such as BE and to what extent these policies actually um, are, are enforced. Because in much of the rest of the world, um, policies like these are frowned upon. You will not find a policy like BE. You do find affirmative action in the rest of the world, but a policy that goes as far as BE does. And I think it's one of the policies that goes, that has the greatest distortionate effect in the South African economy. You will, you will find, actually, um, I think, I find that uh, international um, companies, clients, suppliers, um, they do not care about that. They care about whether you deliver on time, on quality, and so on. So uh, you can actually, that's sort of, let's call it jurisdictional diversification. You can try that. A fourth possibility is that you could play the game. Um, and I'm trying to make a, a value neutral, say this in a neutral manner. You can, you can play the game. Many companies have. Maybe some of you have. 
Um, because you, you made a calculation, maybe a little bit as Peter discussed earlier when, he's, when he said about the theory of government. He said, you can calculate this into cost of business. Um, he, he used the example of corruption, but if that's the only way of doing business, sometimes you have to, you have to consider all the ethical factors, you have to consider uh, what that do to your business, and then sometimes you might decide to, to go ahead with something, even you find, though, though you find it ethically objectionable, because you think uh, in the end it still serves society. That might be the case. Uh, if, you, if you play that game, um, then uh, it's good to get good advice, and there are increasingly uh, companies and, that can advise on this. My, my guess would be that you would want to look for companies that don't think BE is a good idea, that, that actually understands it's a bad idea, and get them to advise you, rather than companies who say BE is the greatest thing and we should all participate in this, um, because they'll probably give you bad advice. They'll give you the advice that doesn't minimize the damage uh, the economic damage of BEE. And you want to find an advisor who helps you find the minimum damage. I call it a rigged game. Uh, again, the economist Russell Lamberti uh, recently tweeted something like, the way you play a rigged game is you don't play it. And there's something to say for that. Because what's a rigged game? A rigged game is a game where the rules keep changing. The rules keep changing just as you uh, reach a certain threshold of, of ownership or just as you've reached a threshold of uh, management control suddenly the, that thing moves up or down. But that's rigged, because the, the outcomes are never clear. And it's also not surprising then that uh, Hausman and Asimoglu and others, in their recommendations by, on the, by request of President Mbeki, said that there should be a sunset clause to something like ownership uh, in BEE. But I don't see any sunset clauses on the horizon. Um, certainly, um, that means that you, when you play this game, um, when you decide that that is the best thing to do um, under circumstances, keep in mind that the games, the rules are going to change. And so your strategy should be um, such that it can accommodate rule changes. Um, and uh, just to, to re-emphasize um, uh, this point, um, uh, this again from the Department of Trade and Industry under Minister Rob Davies. This means that a significant proportion of black persons' ownership of assets and enterprises must be a controlling interest, reflecting genuine participation in decision-making at board, executive management, and operational levels, uh, and the assumption of real risk. So whatever you do, unless you do this, uh, the rules are always going to change. And, uh, and I assume that this is not necessarily what you want to do if you're a family business or uh, if you... Um, Depending. So, point is that the, uh, the rules are going to change in this direction. They're going to keep changing in this direction. And so, you should keep that in mind. Um, you've heard the word fronting. Uh, and uh, the, uh, it's increasingly frowned upon from government side. And there are legislative efforts to uh, prevent fronting. There are now penalties for fronting. But economically speaking, and I'm not uh, in a position to to recommend to you to do fronting because that seems to be against the law. But economically speaking, it is my professional judgment that it is better for society, better for everyone in general, if companies were to do fronting. What is fronting? It is to try and comply with le legislation but without removing control from the best entrepreneurs, without transferring control to less able entrepreneurs, to politically appointed entrepreneurs. All right. So that's just a professional, economic, theoretical pronouncement, but I think it would be better for the economy. It's maybe a little bit like Darby Ruth said, yes, it's important to pay as little tax as you can. Um, uh, but um, this is, of course, all serious business. Um, increasingly, legislation um, comes with penalties and comes with risk. And, um, and in that sense, my final recommendation would be that whatever you do, consider the right thing to do, consider uh, what it means to your business, and uh, get the best advice you can um, on, uh, on this. Um, and finally, if I may conclude, I hope that some of what I've said would enable you, whether you're in business or in policy making or reporting, to give a good argument for why BE is not a good idea. It doesn't have anything to do with race. It has to do with the mechanism of replacing economics and the market with politics. Thank you for attending the seminar.
Hartelijke welkom bij Sakenplein. Sake wat? Goeie vraag. Ek sal verduidelik. Sakenplein is eindelijk baie eenvoudig. Dit is een marktplein online. Lees jou bezigheid, lok nieuwe klante, krijg sakevernote, kom bij mekaar sakekamers en nog baie meer. Om te zien wat Sakenplein en sy mense vir jou kan doen, registreer vandag jouself of jou bezigheid op sakeplein.com. Sakeplein. Skepwaarde. Mark Vince.